Well, good morning. There is a uh, right way and a wrong way for preaching to be conversational or dialogical. And by the time the preacher gets to the pulpit, the preacher better know what the preacher is going to say. Uh, this is not the time for preaching to be a conversation in that sense or a dialogue. This is the time for the preacher to do what the preacher is called to do. But the appropriate way that preaching is a dialogue or a conversation is that the preacher had better be attentive uh, if he is going to be faithful to this calling uh, to the conversation that is taking place amongst those whom he loves and he serves by the Word. So we have to believe that God's providence sometimes orders how we hear these conversations and how we overhear these conversations. And I, I've learned so much over decades now of ministry as uh, I, I've discovered people now round up my age. I, uh, I'm quite happy with rounding down, but <laughs> rounding up seems to be with the uh, habit of the young or the old glad to be joined by new ranks. And so when I came here and was a very young man, first of all, coming here at age 20 as a Master of Divinity student, and then coming here as president at age 33, uh, that's quite a different situation than being in my 60th year, uh, into my third decade in this responsibility. So, so let me be blunt about that. It, it, it's not necessarily that I am hearing new things. It is that I have heard some, I've, I've heard some issues raised. I've heard some conversation that has certainly caught my attention in a new way of late. But it, uh, it is, to speak quite honestly, I, I think I can speak about some things now I could not have spoken about before. Uh, competence will be one issue. It takes a certain amount of experience in life as a Christian, which is a preacher, but, it, but as a Christian to have confidence to speak about certain things that otherwise would be unspeakable. It, it takes, I dare say, a certain amount of security uh, to speak about insecurity. It, uh, it also takes a bit of age uh, just to be able to say, I wouldn't have dared spoken about this as a younger man. I feel a responsibility to speak about such things as an older man, mostly intentionally to those who are younger than I. And, and not just younger, because that's most of humanity now, but <laughs> younger in this room <laughs> and younger in this school. And, uh, and younger in this calling, and younger in the Christian life. To put the matter bluntly, I don't know that I would have known to preach the sermon I'm about to preach today as a, a younger man. But more than that, I would not have known how to preach this sermon, which I hope by God's grace to preach today as a younger man. I now feel the burden uh, to preach this sermon, something I hope is a gift as uh, an unexpected word, uh, an extremely personal word. When I, I indicated that this is going to be the most personal sermon I've probably ever preached, uh, I think it really is. I, I think in some ways it's only preachable because of the life that I have lived. And, uh, but, but, but it's preachable here with urgency because it's the life we all live in one sense. When I'm preaching a sermon entitled, The Last Temptation of the Christian, I, I mean this about all believers, but my pastoral concern is, uh, is you and, uh, and those who amongst you are studying here at Boyce College and Southern Seminary. This is, a, this is a message more than anything else for you. Here at uh, this school, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us is community. And the longer I am here, the more thankful I am for it. It was not always so. It is so now and has been for some time. This is the Lord's doing. 
we, we sense that we are a part of a community of, of those who are gathered together for a sacred purpose, a community of students, and, and that includes seminary students and undergraduate students. That's not an accident. That's an intention. That's what we want this community to be. That's what we celebrate this community to be. It, uh, it, it, has, been, it has been one of the greatest experiences of my life to see this community, by God's grace and by the love of Christ, come together, students and faculty and, and administrators and other servants of this institution, all of us drawn together in one place at one time for one school with one mission, and, and of course, as, as we are organized and, and committed to, organized around and committed to specific truths, a, a, con, a confessional institution. So our community is not accidental. We just don't happen to be in one place. It's not even merely educational, although it's irreducibly educational. It's theological. It's, it's spiritual. That's why we have chapel services, not just assemblies. That's why we, we sing hymns together, and that's why we, we hear the preaching of the Word together. That's why the, the, the basic tenor of the Christian life is what's driven through what it means to learn here, what it means to teach here, what it means to serve here. So, community is rich, and there's a sense in which, especially as students, and, uh, and particularly as undergraduate students, primarily living in the dorms, but also graduate students in the apartments and, and all over the campus as we've tried to, to even architecturally encourage that community. Community happens, and for that I am very thankful. We serve together, we live together, we, lear we learn together. This is a place to find true community. But there's another side to that, which is this is also a place where it's easy to be lonely. Uh, and part of that is just because at some point we are inside ourselves, every single one of us. At, at, at some point, the conversation stop, the, uh, the cafeteria is closed, the, the coffee shops are closed, everything's closed, uh, the, it, and it, it's just you. And, and, and this is true even if you're in a dorm or a suite or an apartment. It's true even if you're in a marriage, in a family. There, there are inevitable times when you close your eyes and when you are alone and it's just you. And, and that's when the questions can come, the kinds of questions you hold off when you are in community and in conversation, but the kinds of questions that, that press upon us when we are, in this very important sense, alone. And the Christian life itself can be lonely, even in the midst of community. And, and the Christian life, as revealed in Scripture, sometimes counts on this. There's a certain, there's a certain sense, a certain biblical sense that we are, we're called to introspection, and, and the Christian life can't be healthy without introspection. And we, we experience this time and these repeated times of, of being alone in our own brains, in our, in our own heads, in which all kinds of things come. And, and, and these include questions, maybe even doubts, and, and they come to us. The, the Bible says that we are to interrogate our hearts. We are to search our hearts. We are to, we are to suspect our hearts. We, we're, we're told in Scripture to make our calling and election sure. We're, we're, we're called to test ourselves and make certain that we be Christians, that we are Christians in heart and soul and confidence and rest, in service, in action. This uh, seminary and this college must be safe places for learning, a safe place for asking questions, a safe place for discussion. But in many ways, the most threatening context is simply when we're alone, when we are surrounded by quiet, when the, when the noise that can distract us and the activities that can distract us come to an end, and we're just left with ourselves. So why this discussion today? Why, why this sermon? What is it exactly that I have been hearing? The danger would be that I'd be so imprecise, no one's going to know what the last temptation of the Christian is. I, I don't want to talk around it. I want to speak to it. I, I believe the last 
temptation of the Christian is to try to hold ourselves Christian. The, the last temptation of the Christian is to doubt the faithfulness of Christ. Specifically, the last temptation of the Christian is sometimes to wonder if we really are Christians. Some of the conversation I've heard just, uh, just in the last several months, a conversation that comes from students and sometimes from the parents of students, sometimes from the friends of students, sometimes uh, from the teachers of students, and, and, and sometimes here, mostly here, sometimes elsewhere. The kinds of questions that come to us, do I really belong here? A am I really called to ministry? Is this, is, is, is this where I'm supposed to be? And, and perhaps at the, at the level of college students, the, uh, the, the, the question, am, am, am I the standout here? Am, am I the odd one here? Is, uh, because everyone else appears to be so uh, stable <laughs> and put together. And uh, when I'm alone, I don't feel so put together. Uh, do, do I belong here? This is a school, as a college, and as a seminary that requires credible Christian confession for admission. That's a, that's a very important issue. We're a school not only about Christianity, we're a school of Christians. A am, I, am I a Christian? What, what does it mean for, be, for me to be a Christian? Every single moment, every single second, every single day, every single class, what does, what does that mean? I think a, a part of the problem here is, uh, is natural to the Christian life and is natural to different stages of the Christian life and even the different stages of, of, of human life. The, uh, the message series that I preached some months ago on the four seasons of life, a biblical theology of childhood and adolescence or youth and adulthood and age is… Uh, is now, and this is no commercial because it's free, it's, it's, it's now a free ebook, uh, kind of offered uh, to the church in hopes that it will be, be of help. And, and when I preached on adolescence, one of the points I wanted to make is that th throughout human experience, as even reflected in Scripture, and certainly better understood now psychologically, adolescence is a period of, of, of in which the identity crisis comes. It's, a, it's an identity crisis that's unavoidable in adolescence. There's no way for a child to end up as an adult without going through that passage of an identity crisis in adolescence. But the more I think about it, and, and even having preached about it and written about it and talked about it for years, the, the, the more I want to say to adolescents, it's not so much that adults get over that identity crisis as it is that adults get busy. In, in one sense, I think that identity crisis just stays with us. We just, we just move into responsibility, and uh, some of the urgencies of that identity crisis Fearless. Let me speak specifically about something else. A, a part of the Christian life that, that, that is so familiar and close to some is, 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 is distant to others. And I, I'm, I'm sure this is common in different places and different times, but I think it is a particular problem for young men in American evangelicalism. And, and what do I mean by that? What, what I mean quite specifically is this. And, and, and this was a problem for me as a young man and as a teenage boy, and it, uh, it in some sense continues to be a problem for me now. And, and that is all the language about the heart and knowing your heart and, uh, and, and feeling things in your heart. And, 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 and let me just tell you, that does not come naturally to the XY chromosome. It really doesn't. It doesn't come natural to the male mind. And there's, a, there's an inadequacy, a mismatch here, because evidently it comes far more naturally uh, to females. And, uh, and, and a part of what males do, and I hate for females to hear this as, 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 as they're likely to, uh, you just need to realize that throughout a lot of life, the male of the species simply tries to connect in ways that evidently are far more natural 
uh, for females to connect, the, the heart language. And, and, and maybe this is a part of social conditioning, maybe this is a part of cultural shaping, but I, I think it's more than that because I think you see it reflected throughout almost every human society. Heart language comes far more, far more awkwardly to men than to women. And, and talking about it doesn't make it better. Uh, and, and so if your idea is we'll get young men together and say, let's learn to speak heart language, that is not what's going to happen. I mean, just tell you, it's not going to come close to happening because talking about it in that context even makes it worse. How do you really know your heart, man? Dude, how's your heart? That's about the conversation. That's it. I don't know. Good. Fine. Don't know. Uh, you know, I… Now, the, the, I'm, I'm not saying that we should be satisfied with that. I'm just saying there's a sense in which we can hear conversation, even sing hymns, and, 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 and we can hear sermons and other things, and it just, it just somehow just elides. It just, it just kind of goes past us, and, and we know it's not supposed to. And, and the Christian church has recognized this for a long time. And, uh, and, and that's why the Christian church has said to men of all ages, beginning at young ages and older, get busy You're doing something for Jesus. Let's, let's get you active. Let's get you moving because the heart language, it, it's, it's not that it's completely alien from us, but it just doesn't come naturally to us. And, and I think there's a sense in which, and this is a part of the conversation that I've been picking up on, there, and, and I can connect to this. This is what I want to say today when I say this is a very personal message. I think there are some on this campus, even right now, who are saying, I don't always feel the way I think I'm supposed to feel. I'm, I'm not sure that I, that, that I know how to connect all this. I, I, actually, I actually, if I am honest, am not always as confident in the faith as I know I'm supposed to be. I don't always feel as warm in my heart as, as I know I'm supposed to feel. I sometimes don't connect. In, in ways that give me confidence, e even with myself. I, I had a conversation uh, just in the last few days in which, um, speaking of a young college student here, someone told me, he, uh, he looks at everyone else and sees how together they are, and he just doesn't think maybe he belongs here because he's not so together. Well, here's headline news for you. The people you're looking at aren't nearly as together as they look. And, and, and a statement was made, actually, and this convicted me in the heart, in which the statement was, it's, it's very difficult sometimes as a student at this school to look at the faculty or, or to look at you, they were speaking to me, and see how confident and assured and in it, you always are together, held together, always together. And others just don't feel that they can measure up to that. Well, let me just tell you something. I'm not as together as it looks, not all the time. And, and neither are the faculty members who teach you with such confidence and uh, and love, and concern, and truth, and conviction. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely persuaded of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm absolutely confident of the convictions upon which we stand. But it isn't because I can hold myself together. I, I want to talk about why I have that confidence and from whence from whom that confidence comes. I want to ask you to turn with me to, Matthew, to uh, Mark chapter 9, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. Mark, of course, is the shortest of the Gospels. What makes that noteworthy in this case is that it's Mark amongst the synoptics who gives the longest, most detailed attention to this event in the life of Jesus 
that we're about to read. Mark thinks by the Holy Spirit this is really important and gives us more detail than even Matthew and Luke. We read beginning in verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is God's word and, of course, the account itself is so poignant. One of the things we see in here is the love of a father for his son. The, the language is really interesting. If we had time, we could just, we could just imagine the, the dimensions of fatherly love that is uh, indicated here in this text. The, the father and the, uh, speaks of the son's problem, and he says, help us, not just help him, help us. It's the father's identity with the son. It's the father's love of the son that leads him to bring him to Jesus. Later in the text, when Jesus is speaking to this man, at the most crucial point, he is not identified as a man. Instead, as you see in verse 24, it's the father of the child who cried out. That's what's important here. He's not just a man. He didn't just bring this boy. He's the father of the child. And then he cries out to Jesus, help us. There's something unspeakably sweet and powerful about that, but that's not the main point of the passage. We could speak of the inability of the disciples to cast out the demon from this boy, and, and, and that's a proper concern too. It's a concern of Jesus when Jesus speaks with exasperation, and not about the crowd. Jesus speaks with exasperation about His disciples, and trying to put all this together just, just without much time to look at this dimension, just look at how the passage ends when the disciples, at the end of all of this, after Jesus has cast the demon out, and after the boy is healed, when people thought He was dead… It, it, it's thereafter that the disciples speak to Jesus and they kind of ask, and you can imagine how sheepishly you would have to ask this question, Lord, why were we unable to do this? And, and Jesus says, well, this kind, and, and you notice there's calm. This is not so much a rebuke. This is a, the, the, J- Jesus is kind when they ask him the question. He rebuked them when they couldn't do it, but when they ask, why couldn't we do it? Well, well then Jesus speaks differently and he says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer, which is another way of saying, you're right, you can't do it. Individually, you can't do this. Uh, Corporately, you can't do this. The whole community now knows you can't do this, But, but I can do this. This kind comes by prayer. Pray to me. I will do this. 
just as his father asked me. But of course, what I want us to look at is verse 24. This amazingly honest statement by this father who has loved his son to bring his son to Jesus. And when Jesus responds to his request, help us if you can, (laughs) and then have compassion on us and help us, Jesus said to him, if you can. All things are possible for the one who believes. It's, it, it, it's really interesting. He says, help us. Have, have compassion. If you can do anything, it, it's impossible, even looking at the Greek, to understand exactly the emphasis. The, we, we, we don't know exactly what syllable was emphasized. We don't know exactly. It was a, the, if you can, does that mean, I, I think you can, and, and because I'm really saying if you can, but I mean you can, then because, because you can do it, or does it mean if you can, can you do even this? And then Jesus responds by throwing the statement back at him, if you can. All things are possible for the one who believes. Now, now if we just stopped there, then we've got kind of a recipe for for, for what so infects so much of the world and prosperity theology and the word faith movement and the, the whole name it and claim it impulse. If you can, if you believe, all things are possible if you believe. If you can just believe enough, if you can just summon up enough belief, if you can just demonstrate enough belief, then all things are possible and all things are promised to you if you only believe. And of course, belief is so central to the Christian faith. Let's just step back for a moment and, and realize that, that salvation comes to the one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes on Him, believes in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. But as as many as received Him, to as many as believed in His name, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, the children of God. If, If you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. There's no way to get around belief. And it's the first verb. It's, 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 the, first, it's the first sign of salvation is belief. And, and then, of course, this gets, this gets displayed throughout the, the explanation of the gospel, which is what we summarize with justification by faith alone. And on this day after the 501st anniversary of the Reformation, I stand before you to tell you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is still, as always, and eternally summarized by those solas. Scripture alone, grace alone. Christ alone, faith alone, to the glory of God alone. We, we, we understand that salvation is by faith alone. We are justified by faith alone. But we need to remind ourselves that that faith is not faith in faith. That faith is faith in Christ. It, it, it's all of grace. And so, here's where we need to remind ourselves, before we even look further at this passage or delve deeper into this question, one of the temptations of the Christian life is to believe that we secure the faith that saves. But brothers and sisters, we do not secure the faith that saves. Christ secures the faith that saves. If securing that faith that saves is up to us, then we are doomed Because there is no way we can secure our own faith in Jesus. We are to make our calling and election sure by looking at our lives and and looking for evidence of Christianity. We are to interrogate our hearts. But at, at, at the end, we can't hold ourselves for a second. Our security is Christ. When we speak about the doctrine of assurance, which again, we need to remember was perhaps the most revolutionary of the doctrines of the Reformation. The Catholic Church in the Council of Trent sought more emphatically, it can be argued, to, to, to contradict the Reformers on the assurance of salvation than anything else. Because as we believe, it is the very gospel 
We, we, we have the gift of assurance knowing that the one who trusts in Jesus and believes and repents of sin is saved, period, saved to the uttermost. We have the confidence of the Apostle Paul that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion on that day. And, and you'll notice how all the action verbs here eventually come back to our security in Christ. The denial of the assurance of salvation is not an insult to the Christian, it's an insult to Christ. And, and we understand the call to perseverance. And again, it's a, we understand that there's a responsibility that comes to us, but it's the responsibility of the ones who are secured by Christ. It's not the responsibility of those who can secure ourselves. Not one person you'll ever see on this campus has secured his or her own salvation or is securing it even as you watch. We are not securing it. Our confidence, our conviction, our assurance is not secured by ourselves. It is secured by Christ. It's secured by Christ alone, and it is secured assuredly by Christ and by Christ alone. And, and, and that's what gives us assurance. The assurance is not in ourselves because we can't even keep ourselves from being distracted. To be human is, is to have this, uh, th this kind of, of attention deficit problem. That, that, that's to be human. Maybe, again, it's to be more male than female, but the reality is we can be in the most intense moments of our life. We can be dealing with the most ultimate existential questions. We can be considering the, the most urgent biblical truths, and there goes a butterfly by the window. That, that's, just, that's just the way we are. And, and evidently, the disciples were the same way. Jesus sometimes rebukes them because they can't even stay awake while He's praying. Human, all too human, and, and, and believers are still human. We are, we're united to Christ, we have the indwelling Christ, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the reality is we fall asleep in sermons. We have our attention diverted when we're thinking about, pondering, and reading about the most glorious of eternal truths. We are human, all too human. Think about what this man says. I believe, help my unbelief. Thank God for this man. I am so thankful that this event in the life and ministry of Jesus happened and is recorded for us in this kind of detail in the Gospel of Mark. I'm, I'm so happy to know about this boy that was healed. I'm so happy to know about this father's love that compelled him to bring his boy to Christ. I'm so happy for the display of the fact that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the firstborn of all creation, the one who is preeminent over all creation, the one who can announce to the demon, leave, and the demon has to leave. I'm so thankful for that. But I want you to know I'm incredibly thankful for this unnamed father whose statement is an essentially Christian statement, even though you will not find this often preached. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And I think you look at that and you say, well, you know, evidently he was a very young and immature Christian. Well, Probably so, in the sense that even at this point in the Gospels, he, he's a Christian because he simply is drawn to Christ. What we see is a Christian response of faith in Christ and, and an understanding of who Christ is. He's, he's trusting Christ with everything. And so we understand even in the sequence of the Gospel of Mark, yes, we're going to call this man a believer. But what kind of believer is he? He's the kind of believer who, when told all things are possible if you believe, looks to the Jesus of Nazareth who is the Alpha and the Omega, the incarnate Son of God, and simply says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And, and, and you think, well, that's in the beginning. You know, I just want to tell you that I have absolute confidence because of my own pastoral experience that those who reach even the most advanced of years as Christians and have the longest pilgrimage and testimony as Christians I guarantee you that in this life, they never reach a point in which they say, Lord, I believe, without needing to go further and say, help thou mine unbelief. Help my unbelief. That, that's actually a Christian prayer. It's one that should be an encouragement to us. When we speak about faith alone and, and, and the faith, the, the believing 
that is defined by the gospel, we understand that it, it, it means settled conviction, it means intellectual agreement, it means personal trust. Yes, all those things. It means settled conviction, intellectual agreement, personal trust. It comes down to believing that God's promises are true, and beyond that, that God's promises in Christ are true for me. Not just true, that, that, that's first, but it, that His promises are true for me. But we don't believe in justification by faith and faith alone. We believe in justification by faith in Christ alone, and that faith is secured by Christ as much as our salvation itself is secured by Christ. The faith that saves is Christ's gift. So what about doubt? Help thou my unbelief. What, what, what exactly do we do with that? I believe there are two different kinds of doubt. There is a, a healthy doubt and an unhealthy doubt. There's an even faithful doubt and an unfaithful doubt. There's a, th there may be, I think even it's right to say, a holy doubt and an, an unholy or a sinful doubt. What would be the distinction? Uh, the, the healthy doubt is this. It's the doubt, the doubt that doesn't question the character of God, but merely comes to understand that we have an urgency to know more in order to understand better because conviction comes with greater understanding. And, and I, I learned this as a very young man, even in questions as basic as the existence of God when I was confronted by an atheist teacher in high school. What, what, what do I do with this? And, and I, I'll simply tell you, my, my, my temptation was never in the first sense to be an atheist because the, the whole existence of, of everything that I knew, my, beginning with myself, and then it, it, it wasn't, wasn't plausible that all of this is an accident. And, and, and by the way, I, I just don't believe that even the people who are trying to make the most radical atheist arguments really believe what they're saying when they close their eyes at night. Or when they look into the face of a baby, or when they look at the, at the awesomeness of the cosmos. I don't believe, honestly, to any to any human being, it's really plausible that all of this is an accident in which there is absolutely no meaning. And that's not plausible to me. I don't believe it's plausible to you. And, and, and thus we work backwards on the fact, okay, that's not plausible. So, so atheism itself is really not plausible. The only thing we agree with with the atheist, and this is really important, we agree absolutely with the atheist that the most important question is whether or not God exists. That we agree with. We agree, that, and, and by the way, what that means for me is that there's no middle ground. I have no interest. If, if, if it turns out, if it, if, it, if it just playing a mind game, if it should ever be that God is not, then I, I don't want anything to do with liberal Christianity. What good is that? I don't want anything to do with kind of mushy, insane New Age junk. I mean, if, if, if life is meaningless and we're an accident, then eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. That's all there is to it. That's what we agree with the atheist about. It all comes down to this. But, but then we just are, are pressed back. And so I was asked by someone the other day, you know, when, when you went through a time of, of, of desperately seeking to understand these big apologetic questions, I, I said, look… Uh, what I fell back on was plausibility. It's just not plausible. Now, I am not standing here preaching this gospel on the basis of plausibility. I'm, I'm here speaking to you on the basis of the verbally inspired, inerrant, and infallible Bible. So how did I get there? Because if it's not plausible that there is no God, then it's also not plausible that He doesn't speak to us because He speaks to us in creation. We can follow this out. We don't have it. Let's put it this way. It, 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 it's walking a simple line of, 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 of trusting logic to where you get from the implausibility of the accidental nature of the universe to standing in this pulpit and preaching to you from the gospel of Mark, which is the very Word of God. And, and, and it may take a little bit of time to get from one place to the other, but that's what the Christian life is all about. And that, that's actually the reason this school exists, is to help people to get from A to B to C to D in order to be able to serve the people of God with conviction and with courage and, yes, with compassion and with grace. And, you know, over time… Over time, we, we are more able to hold ourselves together. So let me tell you the secrets of how that happens. 
They're, they're not really secret. They're just rarely spoken of as honestly as I mean to speak about them today. How do we move into a proper confidence, into a proper conviction? How, how, how do we, not trusting ourselves, trust Christ in this too? Knowing that the gospel is true, deeper confidence that we believe that God's promises in Christ are true and true for me, and believing that I and we are thus safe in Christ. How? Number one, by what the Reformers called the ordinary means of grace. The ordinary means of grace. So, you shouldn't expect a Christian who doesn't go to church, and a Christian who doesn't regularly read the Scriptures, and a, a Christian who does not hear and, and yearn to hear the preaching of God's Word, the Christian who neglects the fellowship of the saints, the, the Christian who, who doesn't come together to sing just as we got to sing just a, a, a few moments ago. You know, a part of what we do in singing isn't all that gloriously musical, although thankfully it, it is gloriously musical. It's more gloriously spiritual because we, we're, we're, we're hurling truths at one another. We are just as we read in the New Testament. We are encouraging one another, encouraging one another. Do you hear that? That's the Pauline language. We are encouraging one another with with, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We are doing apologetics by note, word by word through a song. Because why? By the ordinary means of grace, it, 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 conviction and courage are channeled into our lives. We, 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 we didn't know that was apologetics, but brothers and sisters, it is. It's a, it, we, we are singing truths that become a part of the logic of our heart as well as the logic of our minds preaching, prayer, and the fellowship of the saints. And why are they the ordinary means of grace? It's not because they are ordinary in the sense that, that they are not supernatural. They are supernatural. They're ordinary in that they are given to all of Christ's people, all of Christ's people. They're ordinary gifts. They're not priestly gifts. They're not sacramental gifts. They're, they're ordinary gifts in this sense, given, given to Christ's people. And that would include the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We see these things. We experience these truths, and conviction and assurance come into our hearts. Secondly, learning and study. That's a part of the glory of this institution. That's what makes me so proud to be president of this school and, and makes me so proud just to be a part of this school, the seminary and the college, because conviction comes by knowing more. And there is no better place to learn every single day, every single hour, more about Christ, more about the Scriptures, more about the grand truths and the, the total tapestry of the Christian faith. There, there, there is nowhere better, safer, more more able to teach you about how Christians have dealt with these truths and read the Scripture throughout the ages in order to step into a, 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 a trail of faithfulness, a, a, a stream of conviction in which we find our identity in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's no institution I know, and of the, this is the happiest thing I can imagine. There's, there's no institution I know that is going to do a better job of that than this institution. There's no faculty I know that's going to do a better job of that than this faculty. You, you'll believe more when you know more. Third is friendship. We need gospel friendships. We, we, we are not good alone, and, and, and we're, not, we're, we're not good in isolation. And by, by this friendships, I don't, I don't just mean the kind of chatty conversational friendships. Those are important too. I don't just mean the kind of surface level friendships. I mean every single one of us as believers. And, and again, I'm speaking to men and to young men as well as to women. Women get this when men don't, and young men don't get it perhaps even more than older men who've learned it by pain. You need friends to whom you can be absolutely honest. You need, you need a friend who can interrogate your heart. You, 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 you need a friend who, to whom you can express, I believe, help my unbelief. You, you, need, you need a friend who's going to pray together, learn together, read Scripture together. You're going to have fun together. You're going to have conversation together. And, and a part of what it means to be male friends in this sense is that it's not the only thing you talk about. But you do talk about it. We're not good at interrogating our own hearts. We need a friend who can interrogate our hearts and encourage us. Frail and feeble as we are, yet together, a microcosm of what it means to be strong as the church in Christ. Fourth, work in ministry. Get busy. 
There is an improper introspection that comes to us that is the breeding house of doubt and of, and of questions because if we are left with too much time on our hands, we have too much time to think thoughts a healthy, busy person will not think. As I said earlier in this message, when you look at a lot of older people and you say they look pretty put together, well, they have to be put together because they've got to raise kids. They've got to be put together because they, they've got a job to do. They've got to be put together because, and you look at the pastor and you say, well, her, certainly, he's totally put together. And by the way, we don't want a pastor who's falling apart. We want a pastor who's firm in the faith. But what makes him firm in the faith? A part of it is he's got to get up and preach on Sunday morning. Some of you heard me tell the story. I won't tell it at length. I began teaching the Bible when I was 16 because my father, who was a groceryman, a layman who was in charge of the Sunday school, was a teacher short, and so he had a teacher in the, down the hall. And so he, he simply told me, you're going to teach Sunday school in the morning. I said, I'm not a Sunday school teacher. He said, you're not today, but tomorrow you will be. <laughs> and and I, I, I was teaching first graders, six-year-olds. And, and I, I walked in there, and I, I, I prepared a lesson, I actually. I, I, I I had never prepared a lesson before. I prepared a lesson for first graders. I, mean, I, I probably couldn't cover 5% of the material, but in any sense, it was, it was material. It was a story, and, and I did get through the story with first graders, and they wanted me to come back. And, and there's, there have been very few Lord's Days since that Lord's Day when I haven't been teaching the Word of God. And you want to know, a lot of my apologetic concerns, a lot of my introspective fears brothers and sisters, began to disappear when it was my job to channel truth and conviction into other hearts, even very, very little hearts. And the strength came into me, even as into them. And this comes down to the fifth, which is teach, not just working in service, but teaching. There, there, there is someone who needs you to teach them the Christian faith. And, and by that, I, I don't necessarily mean with, a, you know, with, with PowerPoint and, uh, and, and formal lectures. I mean, there is someone right now who needs to be mentored in the faith. There is, there is, you, th you think, well, right now, I, I need to be mentored. Well, so does everyone you will see. But there's someone who needs you to teach them, and you will find amazing confidence flowing into you by that. Now, of course, you may be hearing this message and you may say, you know, I'm still not sure I'm a Christian. Well, then settle that right now. Understand that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Face the simplicity of what the gospel is and what the gospel promises. Understand that if you confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to his cross. Understand that the sinless Son of God shed his blood as a substitute, paying the penalty for your sin, and that the Father raised him on the third day as the vindication of his atonement, which means that salvation comes to all who believe on him and repent of their sins, and it comes assuredly. Not because of anything you have done, but all of grace because of what Christ has done. If you have any basic question about that, then just remind yourself this morning of the simplicity of the gospel and seize upon it. But I'm pretty confident that as I look around this room, I'm looking at Christians. If at moments you don't feel quite as confident in your Christianity, then give that up and find your confidence only in Christ. That's actually the gospel in the first place. You don't get over that. That's the gospel in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. So as we conclude, as a, a very young child, uh, I had a real problem with sleep. I was terrified by sleep. I was terrified as a child that if I closed my eyes and went to sleep, I would disappear and cease to be. Somehow in my childish thinking, if I were awake, I could hold myself. I knew myself. 
Th this came very early for me, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I was afraid to sleep. My, my thought was if I close my eyes and I fall asleep, I'm going to disappear and no longer exist. A at some point, sleep overcame me. <laughs> sleep won. And, and amazingly enough, every morning I woke up and I still was. You know what that meant to a little boy? It meant that I could not hold myself. There had to be some explanation for why I woke up in the morning. And again, I go back to that basic plausibility. It had to be because someone else was holding me. Not just something, some, someone. But then again, the older I got, the more I realized when I was awake, I wasn't holding myself either. That's an illusion. I'm not holding myself together right now. I'm not even, as much as with all my heart I want to be faithful, I'm not holding myself to Christ right now. He's holding me to Him. And you who are in Him as well. In 1906, a hymn writer who was, uh, who was writing hymns in the great age of revivals in that uh, er early period in the 20th century, working with the evangelist R.A. Torrey, he met a young man who was a new convert, and this new convert, this very young man who was new in Christ, said to this hymn writer, this tune writer, yes, I'm a Christian, if I can hold it. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to hold it. This tune writer wrote a hymn writer in London and uh, told her about this young man and, and asked for a hymn that would offer assurance. Uh, she actually sent seven and six of them we know not of. Just uh, one of them we know. Ada Habershon wrote a hymn entitled, He Shall Hold Me Fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. Let's just stand and sing it. We know it's true. He will hold me fast. <laughs>